tonight, showdown in Montreal. Justin Trudeau and Andrew Scheer debate for the first time. Québécois, Québécois. Leaders battle for votes in Quebec as support for the bloc grows. Plus, Elizabeth May face to face with undecided voters. You don't even include agriculture in the fight against climate change. She hands out subpoenas like they're cookies. Donald Trump lashes out at Democrats and the impeachment inquiry. We talk with voters in a key state. What's killing hundreds of thousands of fish off Newfoundland? It's hard to sleep nighttime now, just know what I've seen the last couple of days. All I have are negative thoughts. And the real life concern over a comic book villain. This is The National. Well, tonight, federal party leaders are courting a very specific vote that could play a big part in the outcome of this election. It is the first French language debate of the campaign and the first debate in any language with Justin Trudeau in attendance. They spoke directly to Francophone Quebecers in a province where dozens of seats are up for grabs. Leaders of the Conservatives, the Bloc Québécois, the Liberals and NDP were invited to participate. And as Salima Shivji shows us, they were combative right from the start. The smiles and waves on the outside. Inside, a crucial stage for all the leaders, a direct platform to Quebec's unpredictable voters. Right off the bat, Conservative leader Andrew Scheer was the target of multiple attacks, forced to explain his position on abortion. Stating again and again he won't reopen the debate over a woman's right to choose, that other leaders were trying to stoke fear. Liberal leader Justin Trudeau pushed hard, accusing Scheer of hiding his true feelings. On climate change, too, the conservative leader was on the defensive, unable to explain how he would impose a pipeline on Quebec when most Quebecers are against the idea. And Scheer's French at times got in the way, but not when it came to attacking Trudeau for using using two planes to campaign. The Liberals say they're paying carbon offsets. <laughs> Quebec's controversial but popular Bill 21 was also a disruptor. The law that bans some public servants, teachers and police officers from wearing religious symbols. Je ne vais pas fermer la porte comme Trudeau again told the stage he won't close the door to eventually joining a court challenge. The Bloc Québécois, Yves-François Blanchette, kept coming back to the topic, his trump card, comfortable on his home turf with some momentum in the polls. The law would apply to NDP leader Jagmeet Singh if he moved to the province. He was confronted by it hours before the debate even began, a concern voter approached him with some advice. You know what? What's that? You should cut your turban off and you put a little, you look like a Canadian. Oh, I think Canadians look like all sorts of people. That's the beauty yeah, of Canada. Yeah, a symbol of how reticent Quebec's population may be to vote for a Sikh yeah, who Canada, wears a turban. Like you like. So, Salima, what's the main takeaway from this debate? Well, Adrian, the Bloc Québécois Yves-François Blanchette really dominated the night in command of his line, defending what Quebecers care most about. Now, that was to be expected. Justin Trudeau was also quite strong. He quickly diffused an attack on assisted dying legislation with some news that a re-elected Liberal government would rewrite it to make it less restrictive. But the main question after tonight's debate, with the polls quite static since the beginning of this campaign, is will this debate create any movement with two more debates next week? with more leaders on the stage. All right, Salima, thanks very much. Green Party leader Elizabeth May was not invited to tonight's debate, but she did go face to face with voters here in our studio, the third federal leader to do so as part of a special week here at the National. I'm here to tell you that it's just not working. But when will this happen? Because we need this housing now. I know. Technology is the only industry that advances as fast as it is. And if you're not keeping up, uh, you, you fail. Voters take the mic. Elizabeth May takes the hot seat in about 15 minutes. Okay, to politics in Washington now, where Donald Trump turned a news conference with his Finnish counterpart into a presidential tirade. As Lindsay Duncombe shows us, he mocked Democrats, attacked rivals, and even then, he was only just getting started. Listen to this one, President. All the president of Finland could really do today was watch as Donald Trump raged repeatedly. 
And they try and say, oh, let's impeach him. They've been trying to impeach me from the day I got elected. An escalation of the president's ongoing tweet storm, which today devolved into profanity, all caps. All of it a reaction to increased pressure from Democrats. Today, investigating committees announced they will subpoena the White House for documents related to that phone call when Donald Trump asked the president of Ukraine for a favor to investigate his political rival, Joe Biden. Similar subpoenas have already been issued to the Secretary of State Mike Pompeo and Trump's personal lawyer, Rudy Giuliani. Trump blamed Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi. She hands out subpoenas like they're cookies. You want a subpoena? Here you go, take them, like they're cookies. From Democrats, a warning. Stonewalling will have consequences. It's why I say the White House needs to understand that any action like that uh, that forces uh, us to litigate or have to consider litigation uh, will be considered further evidence of obstruction of justice. And obstruction of justice is potential grounds for impeachment. For the White House, the stakes are as high as the emotion. Lindsay Duncombe, CBC News, Washington. Nowhere do the divisions over a possible impeachment run deeper than in so-called purple states, those critical swing states which could turn Democrat blue or Republican red, places like Michigan. That's where our Paul Hunter went to talk Trump. I did not make this decision based on politics. On a rainy afternoon in Lansing, Michigan, inside a jam-packed restaurant. The president of the United States um, reached out to a foreign president and asked for dirt on an American, on a political opponent. Just felt beyond the pale to me. Elissa Slotkin, rookie Democratic Congresswoman, makes her case for impeaching Donald Trump. And I do not do it um, with a light heart. And what I would ask everyone, um, whether you agree or disagree with the decision, is that we treat it with the seriousness that it deserves. Hers is a district that was Republican for a generation in a state won by Trump and key to him taking the White House in 2016. Last week, Slotkin co-wrote an essay on why she now supports the impeachment inquiry that helped send Democrats down that path. Today, gauging appetite for a process that could end the Trump presidency, she got thumbs up. It's a tiny sampling of America, but it's clear voters here mean it. I think the wounds are going to be deep, but if nothing else, we should all be able to agree that uh, it's, it's time to um, apply the law where they allow, the law should be applied. And I think that when we come out of this, um, uh, it, it's going to show who was on the right side of history. Still, Slotkin knows there are all kinds of Americans and Michigan voters who back Trump regardless. That can't be the new normal. That can't be okay to just get foreigners involved in our elections. Indeed, watching from out on the sidewalk, pro-Trump voices were adamant. We knew who he was when we sent him there. He won Michigan fair and square. This is Trump country here. And as Slotkin left, they underlined in this divided country, a fierce battle looms. Paul Hunter, CBC News, East Lansing, Michigan. Back here in Canada, in Ontario specifically, experts have taken a hard look at police suicide. Last year, nine officers took their own lives, and a new report says police can get trapped in their own culture as stoic protectors who must put others first. Joanna Miliota shows us how that can lead to tragedy. The day he ended his life... Sylvain Routier put a chicken in the crock pot for dinner, made plans to meet his wife to put an offer on a new house, and he left a note. Every time I hear of other first responder suicides and it brings me back to um, that feeling of pain and extreme sadness and how in one moment our whole entire lives have changed. Her husband's death is one of the nine police suicides reviewed by Ontario's coroner. A rising star with the Ontario Provincial Police, Routier was with the Tactics and Rescue Unit for more than a decade before being promoted to sergeant a few months before his death. The transition was rough. Years of witnessing trauma had taken a toll. And Sylvain was the first one to say that he didn't want to tell me a lot of the details of stuff he saw at work because he didn't want me to have nightmares and he didn't want to burden me about it. 
But when, when that police officer has no one else to speak to, then they internalize it, and this is the type of thing that can happen. Silence, shame, a deep sense of duty and identity as officers, all common factors the coroner found in all the suicides. So when they lose that identity because they're not fit for duty, and I use those terms from a policing culture, that makes them already worry about themselves. They don't, they, they suffer the, the consequences in themselves. The coroner found an urgent need to normalize the conversation around mental health and to make help accessible. It's why after a string of suicides in its ranks in recent years, a new mental health care plan for OPP officers is in the works. When you call a number or you put your hand up, uh, you are guided through a process from A to Z and making sure that you never feel abandoned. That is some comfort for Routier. So is speaking out about her husband's death. Just because someone's a police officer and they're supposed to be strong and not show emotion and they're, they're the heroes and they are normal people too and it is okay to seek help. Because, she says, silence hurts everyone. Joanna Rumeliotis, CBC News, Toronto. Now to a growing concern on the coast of Newfoundland, where a cleanup operation is underway after thousands, maybe millions, of farmed salmon died earlier this month. Now it's all happening off the island's south coast near the small community of Rencontre East. We're getting a new look at the huge mess being made as the company disposes of all that rotting fish. Chris O'Neill Yates saw it for herself. Very few eyes have seen what we're about to. You can only get here by boat. This cleanup vessel has got a gigantic vacuum and it's sucking all the dead salmon from the farms up and then it's spewing out the residue. There are slicks of salmon oil in the water and we saw what looked to be pieces of salmon there too. But the Norwegian company that owns the fish farm says what's coming out of that ship doesn't contain anything more than small salmon particles. The water that carried those mortalities into the boat gets ejected over the side. That's simply salmon pigment. Uh, it dis dissolves. It's not an environmental risk. Uh, there's no concern there in terms of disease because this wasn't a disease event. It was temperature that killed the fish. The smell of rotting salmon is putrid. But fishermen here are worried about more than the smell. They want to know what this could do to the fishing grounds in the area. I got fish earring, I fish laughter, and I fish scallop. So what did it is to just settle down and pollute the bottom? We don't know. Nobody's telling us nothing. The union that represents fishermen has a lot of questions too. It's clear that it's having some impact outside of the cage sites. We just got to know exactly how much and is there a reason for concern. This environmentalist says he wants to see ocean fish farming pens phased out completely. The coastlines are buried in fat for many, many miles. There's dozens and dozens of cages that have been affected. Um, it's, just, it's just horrendous. It's horrendous. It's appalling to see that this, this, this is occurring in such a pristine, beautiful area. There's no official estimate on exactly how many salmon died. The fish farming company says the salmon died because the water became too warm for too many days. It says it plans to take measures to prevent the problem from happening again. But for now, it's got to get a lot more dead fish out of the water. Chris O'Neill Yates, CBC News, Ron Condor East, Newfoundland. We're following several other stories tonight, including a looming province-wide strike in Ontario. There will be chaos at the schools. It will be difficult. 55,000 education workers could walk off the job as early as Monday if a deal cannot be reached with the province. The workers do everything from cleaning the schools to running the offices, and some school boards are warning they may have to close schools. The union serves strike notice today but says negotiations will resume Friday. And the flu season is just a few weeks away, and already there is a warning that the flu shot might be harder to get this year. Health officials say some provinces may have to push back the start of their vaccination programs. There is a delay in the production and distribution of the vaccine. Manitoba is already warning there will be fewer flu shots available in that province. In New York and other U.S. cities, real-life police are bracing for the arrival of a Batman villain. The new movie, Joker, tells his origin story. How a lonesome loser sank into madness and murder. But... Eli Glasner looked into concerns that susceptible viewers might find a way to relate to a killer. 
In the crime-infested city of Gotham, Arthur is an aspiring but awkward comedian. Well, no one's laughing now. You can say that again, pal. Joaquin Phoenix's powerful performance has already won awards, but some critics and anti-violence groups have warned the sympathetic story of a white loner who goes on a killing spree could inspire others. I didn't know if I even really existed, but I do. In 2012, a shooter opened fire at a theater showing the Batman film, The Dark Knight Rises. Victims' families say they fear Joker's impact. I do believe that if someone's trying to copycat, that maybe a, mo a, a movie like The Joker would be a place where that could happen. In response, one Canadian cinema chain has banned masks and face paint at all showings. As scrutiny increases, the studio has canceled red carpet interviews while the director defends his work. Understanding somebody who's bad or evil doesn't mean we want them to succeed in bad or evil, but understanding it is never a bad thing. If it was only but this critic didn't feel empathy. She felt afraid. I walked out of that theater and walked into Dundas Square, which is a very populated place, and I was scared. And the only solace I had in that moment was that, oh, everyone else hasn't seen this movie yet. Without Batman, she says, the movie celebrates a villain. And how society kind of pushes him to crime and to violence, and I think they're going to relate to that. Exploring the but other critics question Joker's real-world effect. It's still a piece of art, if you want to call it that, or at the very least entertainment, and when we start sort of censoring these things or saying these should not exist, these are dangerous, we get on a very slippery slope. Hollywood has a history of exploring disturbing characters. The controversy around Joker could help the villain dance his way to a record-breaking box office. Eli Glasser, CBC News, Toronto. The clown. When we come back, Elizabeth May goes face to face with undecided voters. Yeah, we brought them together here in studio so they could put their questions directly to the Green Party leader. But nobody wants to talk about this. Nobody comes out and talks to agriculture issues. You're missing nine out of 10 farmers. It's not only my family, but it's other families as well. So we need something done now. How are you gonna work with Trudeau? Or sure, should they um, become prime minister? How do we reach the children of the Arctic, the children of Canada, so that they become responsible citizens? It's going to impact literally every industry. Every industry everyone is in in this room right now. Yeah. It's going to impact everyone. See for yourself how she did. And later we'll ask the undecided voters themselves what they thought of her answers. All that in face to face with Elizabeth May right after the break. And here we are again in the National Studio in Toronto tonight, where we are and have been doing something different all week long. We promised you that this election would be about you, the voters, your questions, your concerns, what you want to talk about. So we decided to give over our interview time, much of it anyway, uh, with the federal leaders to you. Welcome once again to Face to Face with the Federal Leaders. I'm Rosemary Barton. Our studio today, again, uh, full of some undecided voters looking for answers ahead of October 21st. And we've invited another five of those voters from across the country to come and speak one-on-one -on -one with the leaders. And after their conversations, I will probably jump in. But really, this time belongs mostly to the voters. Canadians have already heard at this point from Justin Trudeau and Andrew Scheer. And tonight, Green Party leader Elizabeth May joins us. Welcome, and thanks for being here. Thank you so much, Rosemary. Thanks and thank you time. to all the wonderful voters who've shown up. Thank you. Uh, to be transparent, just so everybody understands the rules, we only gave you the first name, uh, the hometown, and general topics. Mm -hmm. So you are coming in uh, a little bit blind. Uh, and you know how I work, mm -hmm. so, we'll, so we'll, <laughs> we'll get some questions from me as well. We did ask each of the five participants to give us a little video to mm -hmm. introduce themselves to you. So that's where we'll start. Mm -hmm. Hi, my name is Amanda. I'm from Scarborough, Ontario. I'm a wife and a mother to two young girls, and I'm currently on mat leave. Two important issues in this selection for our family are childcare and housing. Childcare, because when I go back to work full time, we'll only be able to afford to put the girls in part time care. Luckily, we have the support from my parents and my in laws. Secondly, is housing, because we currently reside and own a two bedroom condo. We're slowly growing out of it and we'd eventually like a bigger space, inside and out, for our girls to grow up in. Hi. So between childcare and housing, 
we're absolutely strapped. Mm -hmm. We consider ourselves a middle class, but we're grasping at straws just to stay there. You want to bring out a universal care across the country? That's right. When is this going to happen? In six months? In a year? We need this to happen now. We needed this money and this care yesterday. Oh, I totally agree with you, Amanda, and I totally, I mean, number one, thank you for taking such good care of your kids, even though it's a struggle. It's really hard. And we want universal child care. We'll put in a billion dollars a year to make sure it's not just child care, but early quality education in our child care program. Mm -hmm. And we have to make life more affordable. Now, when can I do it? Depends. If I become prime minister, we'll work on it within the first year to deliver universal child care. We also need to think about what we do as Greens is the whole picture. So if your child care is located near where you work, easier to get there on public transit, less stress to get to child care spaces. But honestly, what Canadians are going through in affordability is a crisis. And I'll just, I can just promise you that whatever position I hold after the election, I'll do my best. But we really need it right away. I know. Um, as you can see, we live in a two-bedroom condo. Yeah. We're slowly growing out of it, and we can't afford to move into something bigger. It's not only my family, but it's other families as well. So we need something done now. We can change the tax code to encourage the building of purpose-built rental housing. We can increase access to a more affordable housing by dealing with some of the perverse pressures on our supply to housing. Airbnbs have taken a lot of actual housing out of the marketplace. We can build new housing and we need to hold the prices at levels people can afford. I mean, in 1975, People in your position had to scrimp and save five years to save up enough for their first down payment on their first home. In the GTA now, it's 21 years. I don't need to tell you this. In Vancouver, it's 29 years. It's not sustainable. Housing needs to be a right. People need to have homes, not see housing converted into investment potential for people who are speculating. These are our homes. We have to be able to afford to move into them. So there won't be any... You can't give us a definitive timeline. Well, if, I was a pro if I was prime minister and had what was needed, the affordability crisis, people would feel it easing within the first year. Within the next five years, we could see everybody being able to get to a home they can afford. So how, how would that work exactly? It, it, over, over five years, Canadians would get to a home they could afford. How, how, how does that work? Because housing is, is, most people do regard it as an investment where they put their ep equity sometimes for retirement. Well, it's a, one thing is to have an investment in your home that you actually live in. Sure. Another is to see people speculating with homes that stand empty. So we need to deal with that. That's a distortion. We never used to have a situation where homes in a community were out of the reach of the people who lived in that community. It used to kind of set its own level because no one wanted to try to sell a home that no one could afford. With international speculation, with Airbnbs, there's new pressures. But when you look at it, CMHC has now set a goal <clears throat> that by 2030, every Canadian is in a home that they want, that they can afford. Well, we just need to double that by doing more, by being more committed, by getting... We, we need to change the tax system so that developers can get a reward for purpose-built rental housing, which creates some breathing room in the marketplace that allows people to afford a, a, more, a, a bigger place that they may be renting for a while, saving up for when they get the equity for a down payment. So would you, would you put that speculative tax in place that other parties have promised? We have not put in a speculative tax, but we are taxing Airbnbs. We are looking at ways that we can ensure that housing is more affordable and through different models, co-housing, cooperative housing. There are models that work that help get people into a home that meets their needs. Let's get to our next voter now. No, that's okay. Hi, my name is Danny Onbright. I'm a fourth generation grain farmer from Grayson, Saskatchewan hoping to raise the fifth generation of grain farmers. Sorry for looking a little scruffy, but it's middle of harvest and it's like the playoffs, so you don't shave. Anyways, we're talking about the election. We're talking about agriculture. We have major issues with trade. We have major issues with labor shortages. But one thing I'd like to talk about that nobody seems to talk about is using agriculture in the fight against climate change. Nobody's policies from none of the parties address the good that agriculture could do if it is deployed correctly. Thank you. All right, Danny, my friend, off to you. That's legit. 
because <laughs> nobody's party, and I consider you the most serious about climate change out there, yeah. and you don't even include agriculture in the fight against climate change. We actually do, so I'm apologizing if our platform hasn't been really, em the platform text and what we talk about includes agriculture, because the soil holds carbon. Your farming practices help in the fight against global warming. We recognize that, and the farming community plays a critical role. Regenerative agriculture to ensure that our soil quality is there to hold carbon. So we know that you're facing a lot of challenges because of the climate crisis. This growing season for Saskatchewan but has where been is the a money? real challenge. Because you recognize my emissions, mm -hmm. because you're recognizing everybody's emissions with a carbon tax, mm -hmm. but that loop is not closed. That money does not come back to agriculture to advance carbon sequestration. And frankly, we have the lowest cost per greenhouse gas emissions reduction. And nobody recognizes this. You're not on this you're not out on promoting this. Yeah. Like, and this is a bridge, because agriculture can do so much in the fight, but nobody is over here saying, well, yeah, we should deploy agriculture. Because, because uh, I have to get this out there, because if we're serious, agriculture is Canada's natural advantage. We have huge amount of forest, huge amount of farmland, and that all can be used in the fight. I agree with you, Danny. I don't know how we, uh, if you look at our platform, you'll see that there is funding to go back to farmers who are participating, who are making sure that we're sequestering carbon in the soils. We have programs in there to help. I mean, I'm so glad to see you as a young farmer because we know the average age of farmers in this country is closer to my age than yours. We need young farmers or we're not going to have food. And we need to make sure that farming is sustainable so people who are in the farming community can make their income on farm in secure markets. So we do have programs for supporting farmers. So how much with, money does that, does that amount to? Because if the number is correct, mm -hmm. if you bring a substantial check to agriculture, to farmers across yeah. Canada, you're going to see such wide adoption of these practices. Yeah. It's going to make people's head spin, and we're actually going to do something here. Well, that's right. So what we want to do is bring the agricultural community on board in the fight on climate change. As you know, as a farmer, you're already there. So we have land grants in our program. We have money to support existing farming. We have money to ensure, by the way, you talked about export policies. We'd like to see more of the food consumed in Canada grown in Canada, and we want to support that. So there are bottom line numbers, and I can, and you can find them online. Well, I can show you the numbers. I mean, yeah, but, I didn't but, want to come out here and spit out a bunch of stats out here. Yeah. The other issue I have is, I mean, when we look at what we do about trade, mm -hmm. taking acres out of production, which similar to the U.S. does with prevent plant, we can use greenhouse gas emissions and carbon tax money. You can send it back to farmers to plant cover crops and take acres out of production and, and use that as a tool. Yeah. But nobody wants to talk about this. Nobody comes out and talks to agriculture issues. I mean, the last two governments have been actually pretty bad. Yeah. The Liberals... Terrible. Yeah. Well, we find something we agree upon so very <laughs> fully. Uh, but I want to do whatever we can for Greens to be understood by the agricultural community as on board. A lot of our Green candidates are farmers. They're, they understand the challenge. Well, quite a few. The issue, though, is your ag policy is from, like, 1954. No, it's up. You, no, it's really quite no I read through it. It's, you, you, you're missing nine out of ten farmers. And... The thing is, I know you probably don't think farmers are going to vote for you. Oh, I do. But if you show up with checks, yeah. regardless of people don't even believe in climate change, if you show them a practice, you show them it's profitable, yeah. you show they will do it, the goodness part of it aside. But pitch them on this. Uh, like, and I, I hate to, like, you are the person I actually believe the most will make this happen. Because I don't believe the Liberals have been on this. Because they went to Paris, they saw the 4 in 1,000 initiative, and they dis it disappeared, Yeah. right? You know, farming That's can the be- last one, Danny. Okay. Just so you know. Danny, all I can say is when, we, when you look at the platform, you'll see that we believe that farmers who provide ecological services, and most farmers do, should be paid for that. It's a public good. It shouldn't come out of your pocket. Carbon sequestration helps all of us. Our approach to carbon taxes isn't to hold them in government, but to redistribute them to every individual. So that means we can't use carbon tax revenue to give money to farmers. We use other revenue to give money to farmers. Unbelievably, Danny was nervous. I know that. You probably don't, because he didn't look nervous to me. Good job, Danny. When we come back, push get trans rid of fossil fuels. Yeah, right. You've doubled the targets that the Liberals have in place right. to reach by 2030. I, I don't see how you do those things without some discomfort. More face to face with Elizabeth May. That's next on The National.
Welcome back to Face to Face with Elizabeth May. Let's get to our next questioner. My name is Shirley Frost. I live in Whitehorse, Yukon, but come from a small community of Old Crow in northern Yukon. I'm an, a mother and a grandmother and an elder of this First Nation. The main concern for me is the climate crisis and food security. They go hand in hand for us up here in the north. And that's because we live in the north where we see the effects of climate change on a daily basis. The Gwich'in have been lobbying for protection of the calving grounds for 31 years. We are, um, we're, we're born with this responsibility as stewards of the land. And it's to us, we, that's what we live for. Yes. And we'd like, what I want to know is how do we educate the rest of Canada and how do we educate the, the voters yeah. of Canada about this, this crisis that's happening in, in our northern territories, in the northern world yeah. of our, of our yeah. earth, of our mother earth. Yeah, now when we, we talk about the circumpolar north, we're looking at the changes, as you say, right around the world globally. Yeah. We are committed to recognizing indigenous leadership. When you speak of the relationship with the earth, recognizing a responsibility for stewardship. Those words, I think, resonate with a lot of settler culture Canadians. When you have, I mean, I'm willing to say as a, as a settler culture Canadian and federal party political leader, the earth is our mother. We are killing our mother. We have to identify in very personal terms. The economy is worshipped. Okay, we need to make sure the economy is okay. We need to have a prosperous country. But we also need to resonate to a responsibility to the fact that we don't have any economy without a healthy planet. And when we see the changes happening in the north, the permafrost melting, the ice disappearing, this has global consequences because losing the ice in the Arctic drives major weather events like Superstorm St Sandy or the various events where you've got you know, low pressure systems that sit on one area and high pressure systems that sit on another, that's all being driven from changes in the Arctic. I'm very happy to hear that you know of our, of our plight, uh, that we've been fighting for all of our lives. Yeah. And um, I'm very happy to hear that. And what will you do, like, for the children? How do we reach the children of the Arctic and the children of Canada so that they become responsible citizens? Well, I think our, for our children, and particularly when we think of Indigenous children, um, we as a party completely support the human rights finding. We readjusted our budget to put in the $2 billion that Cindy Blackstock's group just won from the Human Rights Tribunal. Indigenous children have not been getting a fair shake compared to settler culture and other children. Mm -hmm. We want to put in place, though, for all children in Canada, that Canada honour the UN Declaration on the Rights of the Child, that we put in place an, an, uh, an advocate for children in the federal government level so that we're looking at issues for does every child get a good start in life? That early childhood education that Amanda wants, how do we make sure that we put a priority on our children? Because nothing's more important, not to any Canadian. Nothing is important as knowing our kids have a good start in life, go to school having had a good breakfast, and are, get, get a good education that's the equal of any education. An education old crow should be as just as strong as an education in Halifax or Victoria. Okay, I, I'm going to go now too, Shirley, if that's okay. Okay. Uh, what do Canadians need to give up? in order to be good citizens on climate change? Because it can't stay the way it is, I don't think, with your plan. So what do they need to be okay with giving up? Our plan doesn't ask people to give up anything. It asks people to be engaged in a more meaningful connection to government as citizens of a country where they're in charge. But you've we need to you push to get trans rid of fossil fuels. Yes, right. You've doubled the targets that the Liberals have in place right. to reach by 2030. I, I don't see how you do those things without some discomfort. Without the discomfort people. is far more severe if we ignore the climate crisis. I, I, I give and you that, but what, what, is, what is the discomfort that your plan would create for Canadians? I don't see it as discomfort to plug in your car instead of going to a gas station. We are not asking individual Canadians to take on a cost. We're asking the federal government to show the kind of leadership that existed in the 80s. You know, when we decided to protect the ozone layer in this country, which Canada did in the lead, we didn't say, gee, are people prepared to pay more if we lose the propellants in the hairspray that we use? No one actually noticed the difference when we got rid of chlorofluorocarbons. Fossil fuels are more difficult, mm -hmm. And we need to make sure every worker in the fossil fuel sector knows that their, their skills are transferable and we need all those skills. But the cost to this society of holding to the current target, which is 
completely inconsistent with global survival. The current target of the liberals is the same one left behind by Stephen Harper. Obviously, Shears is worse, and, and Jagmeet Singh isn't any better. So where we end up being is we have a chance to ensure our kids have a liberal world. And all people ask me about is what we're prepared to sacrifice. Why is it scarier to talk about saving ourselves and the transformation of an economy where we will have new jobs, what? new businesses will start up, new technologies are raring to go? You good, Shirley? Okay, <laughs> let's move on to our next questioner. Hi, my name is Matthew Mozafari. I live in Toronto and I'm a passionate software developer. I'm 21 years old and this would be my first federal election. I'm very excited, but also taking this very seriously. Since I was 16 years old, I knew that I wanted to be involved in the STEM industry. Fast forward a year later, I built some tools and a mobile app, which are currently being used in the real world. Technology impacts societies and the world around us. That's why it should be taken very seriously. Since I work in the industry, I've seen colleagues leave Canada to pursue other technology opportunities abroad. The reason why I'm undecided for this federal election is because I want to know what our candidates are doing to resolve these issues. Okay, Matthew. All right, so I'm involved in tech and I studied computer science at my university and it became very apparent to me that the way we were being taught these tools and these technologies wasn't the right way. I actually, in 2016, wanted to drop out. And then what saved me was the fact that I started my own company. I, I started to apply myself further. Yeah. Um, when I was in first year, I made a bunch of friends. And then in second year, these same friends in computer science ended up dropping out. What I want to know is how you're going to be taking um, this, this robot tax mm -hmm. and investing it. Because mm -hmm. right now, uh, on your platform, you claim that we're going to be putting it back into the education system, which is great, but it's more important to not just invest it into education, but to actually invest in building a new institutional framework for education, which yeah. helps people transition into the technology industry much more smoothly. Yeah. Well, first of all, let me just say the robot tax is one that is a topic for discussion because artificial intelligence and automation are going to make their bigger impact down the road. So we're forward looking and we're knowing this is going to hit us. It's going to hit our, it's going to hit the world of work. We don't want to be unprepared for it. So we're not putting in place a robot tax like in the first year or anything like that. We need to figure out what kind of automation requires replacement of revenue to the government. But for education, we want to eliminate tuition, but eliminating tuition is something that a lot of industrialized countries in Europe have done. They can afford it, we can afford it, and we also want to eliminate the student debt that is occurring and crushing your generations. So let's say we make it through this education system, yeah. we enter the technology industry, or STEM in general, and we start a business. I've worked with a lot of startups and I've helped them scale out like yeah. with their technologies, and they either make it far and do amazing things, but this Canadian talent and these Canadian startups, yeah. they end up leaving and they go to other countries which allow them to grow and thrive further. Listen, what I think is I've seen a lot of private sector entrepreneurs doing across Canada is self-starting little incubator hubs. So somebody who's brilliant and has a new technology and a new idea has got help from other entrepreneurs. Government should promote those things and fund sure. them so they can grow a whole ecosystem it of entrepreneurs. Difficult, though, because I've worked at... Up, Matthew, so finish I, your okay. thought there. I've worked at incubators, like some of the best in the world, like the DMZ and 111, yeah. and these incubators do amazing things, but uh, they end up, like, some of these companies end up leaving again, and they go to, like, the Silicon Valley, for example, yeah. and it's something that we need to really, really focus on. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree with you more, and I hope we can follow up sometime. That's that's, a, I think, I think, I think he's ready to run for office. Time for a quick break, but up next. We want to take a big broom to Ottawa and do some ethical house cleaning. Got a lot of work there. Face to Face with Elizabeth May continues right after this. Next summer, Tokyo 2020 on CBC, Canada's Olympic and Paralympic Network. Welcome back to Face to Face with Elizabeth May. Let's get to our next questioner. I'm Christina from Toronto, Ontario. I'm a widow with two grown daughters. Last year I retired from a fulfilling teaching career. I love being outdoors. Years ago I completed an undergraduate in environmental studies. I maintain my interest in environmental issues and do my best to minimize my environmental footprint. 
I think all people see and understand the impacts of climate change, and yet, and yet, I don't see enough people willing to give up environmentally harmful and wasteful conveniences. My question is, what will your party do to change the public's mindset to put the environment first? Okay, Christina, over to you. Thank you. Hi, it's a pleasure to meet you. Um, I'm here to tell you that it's just not working. Four decades ago, I completed a degree in environmental studies. Then the scientists told us that unfettered uh, human activity would lead to a climate crisis. And here we are, same message. So my question to you is how would you um, help individuals, uh, businesses, industries change their mindset from mm, convenience uh, to being more ecologically minded. Yeah. Well, Christina, first of all, thank you for all the things that you do from the video. It's very obvious that you do a lot to walk the talk. Uh, we want to do things like encouraging people to know that our throwaway society can be reinvented into a durable society. We put the right to repair in our platform so that people who buy, you know, you buy your toaster, you can no longer ever get it fixed. You buy a, a table lamp, that's it. We need to be able to say these are goods that we want to keep. We don't want them ending up in the trash heap. It's not easy to do that in a society that has been rewired in our lifetimes to one where everything is throwaway. In terms of climate, we just need the leadership because the plans that we will put in place, I know if we call out to Canadians and say, how many people want solar panels on the roofs? Hands up, well, hands up. Mm -hmm. How many people want to help plant trees? Hands up. How many people really want to get rid of the commute in a gas guzzling car and shift over to convenient public transit from anywhere in Canada, including rural and remote communities? That's the plan and it's an exciting one and I think people will want to step up. My big question is, I truly believe that you're going to hold the balance of power. Mm -hmm. How are you going to work with Trudeau or sure, should they um, become prime minister to help them shift their mindset to be to make ecologically based decisions? Well, I hope we elect enough Green members of parliament across the country so that we can have the right kind of influence that says we want to hold the line so that the other parties keep their promises. We want to take a big broom to Ottawa and do some ethical house cleaning. We've got a lot of work there. And we need to make sure that when we work together, it's based on principle, not a quest for power, but principle. Can we actually achieve what we promised to do in Paris? Our kids' future depends on it. It won't be easy, but I will not ever, ever waver on principle, and neither will the Green MPs who go to Ottawa with me. I can work with anybody. Because bottom line, we're all human beings. I find good in every single person so with whom I work that, in Ottawa. So you feel that you will be able to, on a daily basis, push your, the environmental agenda regardless? Environment, economy, survival, they all go hand in hand. Yeah, I do think so. OK, great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank good you. job. <laughs>
a, a mamby pamby, unclear answer. They want a clear answer. She seems well versed in all the different questions that was posed to her. It has changed my um, outlook on how I'd like to vote. This is my first election, um, so I want to really make sure I sit down and think about everyone's platforms. Yeah, I have to think about how I'm going to vote now, for sure. It certainly has given me a lot more to think about, and I do think that I will give the Green Party a lot more um, consideration. Proof positive that politics can hit really close to home. Yeah, so thoughtful. Uh, thanks for joining us, folks, for this special edition of The National. You can watch the full conversation on CBC Gem, cbcnews.ca, and after your late local news on CBC television. And we're doing this again tomorrow night. It is NDP leader Jagmeet Singh's turn to go face-to-face -face with undecided voters. We'll see you then. Good night. Good night.